I'm going to talk about sediment control and some of the pitfalls of not doing good sediment control and some of the things that we've come up with that will um, help in the future. One thing when you've got a, a pond that's decades old, it tends to build up sediment, and there's some telltale signs that you have poor sediment in the pond. Again, you see excessive plant and algae growth, uh, the excessive nutrients. And because of the shallow water, uh, you start to see low dissolved oxygen, and you start to see fish kills, or at the very least, uh, stunted fish populations. And over decades, the contaminants that wash into the pond can gather, and you will actually have sediment that is toxic. And we have uh, experienced that in Lenexa with high mercury levels in one particular you can see that not only in the sediment, but also in the fish and the plants as well. Um, this is one of the ponds that was an older pond that we inherited. And as you can see, it's having the sediment problem, or the uh, algae problems that it's caused. And you, you can see it's um, inaccessible for fishing. It's just that really, a, for, from the public standpoint, the pond serves, serves no purpose anymore for recreation. Our maintenance crews, in an effort to try to combat the algae problem, um, came up with a device they call the alginator, which is basically a big fork kind of device that they put on the, the front of the boat. Then they drive around the pond and try to um, suck up the algae and then load it in a truck and take it away. Obviously, that's not a very sustainable practice. It actually looks kind of silly when you're out there doing it. So. We, we decided we needed to have a more per permanent fix for that particular pond. Um, we decided we needed to dredge the pond, obviously. Um, we looked at a couple different options, hydraulic dredging or mechanical dredging. Um, we, we decided that mechanical dredging was the um, most cost effective, but you do need to drain the pond to do that, either breach it or pump the pond. In our case, we uh, opted to pump the pond dry it takes several days to pump it down, and the drawback to that is anytime it rains throughout the course of the project, you have to start over with the pumping. And we had a lot of rain during that project. Uh, then when you get it all pumped dry, it's, it's a big soup and mess. Um, and there's nothing but just move it around and try to get it into trucks. It's, it takes um, quite a bit of time to do a project like that, and obviously the pond is not accessible at, at the time, so you have to close the pond down. And you, um, since the stuff is soupy, we put it in trucks that we seal it up. And the one thing you can't see in the picture is the, the smell associated with all this. When you drain the pond like that, it smells really bad. And when you've got houses around the ponds, you know, that's always an issue as well. So what we try to do is um, avoid getting sediment into the pond in the first place. That we feel that's the best practice. So any of the ponds we um, we build, we've been building lately, we incorporate four banks into them, and I'll show you about that in a minute. Um, some of the costs associated with dredging, anywhere, we've had a couple of experiences with this, and seeing bids ranging from $50 to $20, $30 per cubic yard. Um, uh, like I said, you lose the use of the pond through the whole, whole process. Um, got a lot of permitting issues to, to deal with. And then a lot of incidental costs, such as um, pumping costs, disposal fees, restoration of the pond when you're done, and you have to get new fish because there's no fish left when you're done. So a better way to manage the sediment is to, to stop it before it gets to the pond. And, Back going all the way up on into the watershed and stopping it before it leaves the, the sites. In urban areas, this often means construction sites, and uh, some of the common uh, devices used on the construction sites um, rock checks, triangular silt dikes, and silt fence, and all that's just designed to pond the water up on site and let the sediment drop out before it leaves the site. We also require gravel construction entrances to knock the mud off the construction <laughs> trucks before they get in the street so it doesn't wash back into the stormwater system and down into the pond. If you're in a rural area, um, 
things like terraces, grass waterways, and um, um, bumper strips are, are good ways to keep the sediment on, on site, as well as using no till. But not all the, all the sediment can stay on the site, so some of it does make its way to the pond. So we started using four bays in front of the pond. So this is one we just completed last summer. Here you can see the four bay at the upstream end of the pond. Um, it's separated completely from the pond, allows the water to settle out, allow the sediment to settle out in this area. We use um, you know, a hard surface along here so that maintenance vehicles can get down there and scoop it out. Another example, um, on a recently completed pond, water is artificially high in this picture, but when it comes down, you can see the rip wrap in through here that separates the Fort Bay from the, the pond. And it, you'll notice an outlet over here as well, but that, that one uh, drains this parking lot up here and some other impervious areas, so there's really not a lot of sediment coming out of that pipe. But the, the main sediment's coming off of a pipe that's over here. And uh, one other example, um, this is about a 10 acre lake in the background. You can just see part of it there. Uh, this ore bay, water comes from this side and it, it um, is separated by a concrete weir and berm. And we'll go into a little bit about how they were cleaning that one out in a minute. Just some general design guidelines if you're gonna put a ore bay in the upstream end of your pond. Um, should make them about four to six feet deep. The size it contain about five years or so of sediment, and then just clean it out with that frequency. Uh, make sure it's easily accessible on all sides, so you can get equipment around it, preferably with a hard surface, as I showed you in that one example. And if you can make a hard surface bottom on it, that's even better. You should consider energy dissipation of the pipe that comes in the floor bay if you have pipe coming in. Um, that will keep the sediment from being resuspended in the washing of the lake. And uh, as the example showed, separated from the pond with the berm, of course, and you know, you need to put a weir on the berm to accommodate the, the higher flows that come through there. And then consider the equipment we're gonna be using to um, to maintain, use for maintenance for the pond. You don't want to make it so big across that you can't reach halfway across with your equipment. Uh, if you need to estimate the soil, a good, a good rule of thumb is the uh, universal soil loss equation, which just looks at the um, ground cover in the watershed and other characteristics. It just gives you an idea of how much volume of sediment you're going to have coming out of the watershed. So quickly, is showing the um, actual maintenance of that um, orbit with the 10-acre lake that I showed you. Here's the inlet coming in from the core bay. You can see we were able to maintain it without pumping the water down, so the lake is still open to the public and the fish aren't affected. Um, that track over there has about a 60-foot reach, so we going to say size it appropriately for the equipment. If you make it 120 feet across, you're going to be in good shape and you can reach the whole thing. And then it's just a matter of putting it in the truck, taking it away, and when you're done, there's very little disturbance, and like I said, the lake is usable all the time. <coughs> it's considerably cheaper. Um, that piece of equipment is $1,600 a week. It took just a couple days to buck out of that one floor bay, and um, all the incidental costs are just considerably less. <coughs> since you're not used, since you're doing it frequently, you're like you're pretty unlikely to have contaminated soils. So you or like they won't have to worry about um, hauling it to a landfill, special disposal requirements, and like I said, the facility can remain open for all the time. And then when you're done, you restore it and it, it looks like new. 